Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's go. Working at a high-end fine dining restaurant requires an incredible level of communication between the front-end staff, including bartenders, servers, assistants, and food runners. We strive to ensure everything needed comes to the table simultaneously, avoiding asking a guest the same question twice. For example, with beverages, if a table has various drinks and one is low, the correct action is not to ask the guest if they'd like another because you may not know what they're having. The guest has already informed the establishment of their drink order. Asking what did you have again detracts from the experience. Instead, find the assistant, server, or check the table in the point-of-sale system to see what the guest is drinking. This way, you can ask the correct question, such as, would you like another old-fashioned with extra garnishes, specifically naming the drink and modifications. The same applies to items like a side of ketchup or aioli. The process involves determining if it was supposed to come with a dish and was forgotten, if the guest requested it and the server forgot to add it, or if the guest decided to order it later, requiring immediate attention. Normally, when food is served, the person in charge should ask if everything looks okay and if they can bring anything else. Enter our guest, Bob. Bob had already been asking for his water and tea to be refilled when they were still quite full, around 70 to 80 percent. He would flag down multiple staff members until they were refilled. One assistant would grab a pitcher and refill, while another assistant would see the glass was full and walk away. The same issue occurred with lemons, becoming quite annoying. Bob saw his steak and fries, which came with aioli as shown on the menu, but he wanted ketchup. A small request, he asked the person dropping off the food, and it was communicated and noted to be out shortly. Next, an assistant offered beverage refills, and Bob asked for ketchup again, it was noted. Then, the server did a visual quality check, and Bob asked for ketchup. This all happened in less than two minutes. Bob ended up asking four separate people for ketchup. Given the urgency of bringing out a side after food has arrived, all four people ended up in the service area, each putting tiny porcelain ketchup pour cups onto silver serving dishes. Each cup is designed to be shared by two people. The conversation began. Food runner. Hey, what are you guys up to? I'm grabbing ketchup for table 12, seat 2. Server assistant. Oh, that's funny. I was also going to grab ketchup for table 12, seat 2. Server. Funny. They asked me for it too, and I was running over here to grab it another server. Oh hey, I got flagged down by table 12 to grab ketchup, clearly. Bob wanted ketchup. We decided all of us would give the guest exactly what he asked for. So, in all our glory, all four of us came back out with our silver serving trays, one at a time, each holding a single side of ketchup. We dropped off four separate ketchup dishes, 15 seconds apart. Bob realized what he had done once he received enough ketchup for eight people, we left all the ketchups on the table throughout the entree course. Other guests humorously asked if that's how Bob eats his steak. We made sure the ketchups were the last things removed before dessert. He barely used a single one. At the end of the day, Bob did not leave hungry. The guests were entertained and so were we. This happened about one and a half years ago, but I recently heard about the extent of my revenge. I was an enlisted Navy service member stationed in Yokosuka, Japan for a few years before being transferred back stateside. I worked in the main hospital that cared for service members and their families. It was a small hospital where everyone knew everyone. Shortly after I left, I heard about a new physician officer working in the radiology department. My friends said he was terrible to work with, but that was nothing new. However, Someone saw him print a letter, left it on his desk, took a picture of it, and sent it to me. He was requesting to move from enlisted housing to officer housing. Edit. I found out it was not a private letter. He actually sent it to housing, which is mostly run by enlisted members. For context, military housing is available for those who are married, have a family, or are qualified based on their rank, depending on the military base. 
Typically, officer housing is much nicer than enlisted housing. In Yokosuka, housing is essentially the same all around because it's overseas. Most of the housing consists of apartments, and each apartment complex is called a tower, such as Fuji Tower. There are nine towers, and two are for officers, as enlisted members greatly outnumber officers. When being stationed, it is the active duty member's responsibility to apply for housing on or off base before arriving, depending on what is allowed. If there is limited space, and you do not apply for housing on time, then you get placed wherever there is space. So, our new officer was placed in an enlisted tower. Mind you, enlisted members have families of their own, and other officers have been placed in enlisted housing before without issue. Here are some quotes from his letter. And yes, this guy has a doctorate in philosophy. I have many valid objections to living in a building of almost all enlisted and even many lower enlisted being an officer. There is a lot of crime, violent actions, drug use, and alcoholism that happen in enlisted housing. There are also sexual assaults and other perverts. I have a good-looking family, a wife and two daughters aged three and four. They are prime targets to be victims of these enlisted deviant activities. My family should be safe in housing that is with officers. Officers are much more respectable, and these types of deviant activities are incredibly rare compared to the deviant activities of enlisted being commonplace. Other officer families will not want to visit us because our family lives in enlisted housing. My children need to make friends with other officer children. My wife needs to make friends with other officers' wives. I need to make friends with other officers. Forcing an officer to live in a large apartment building with almost all enlisted is unethical. You get the idea. This guy basically looks down on all enlisted service members, assuming every single one is a drug user, pervert, criminal, etc. The kicker, he was an enlisted army member before going to officer school. In civilian terms, Think of a manager who discriminates against and calls all his subordinates criminals, violent, alcoholics, perverts, drug users, etc., based on their job position, forgetting that some have families and maybe are not any of those things. And he not only has the authority to ruin your work life, but he can also ruin your personal life, deny days off, make you stay late, write you up if he does not like you, and prevent your promotion. Safe to say, everyone was angry, and I had nothing to lose. I was separating soon, and figured I would have some fun before I got out. I created a burner Facebook account, and posted the letter and the officer's picture on a popular military enlisted group page. Within two days, it spread like wildfire. But I was not done yet. The military has something called challenge coins. Think of trading cards, but custom coins that come in many shapes and sizes, I designed one with his face and a big middle finger on the back. On top of that, I designed stickers to show how proud we deviants are. Other coin designs came from other people as well, but so far, I think mine was more popular. I sold over 70 coins to the person who originally sent me the picture at a huge discounted price so she could sell them for a profit. So the officer's face was everywhere, because most people keep their coins displayed on their desks. No matter where the officer went at work, he would see his face on someone's desk, and since it did not have his name on the coin, they could not officially say it was him. I sold more stateside, and even some got sent to Europe. I made about $3,000 overall, which was nice. The story even got featured in the online naval newspaper, and on two popular YouTube channels. If you are in the military, you know the only time big military cares, is when it is too big to sweep under the rug. This story got the officer sent up to Captain's Mast, which is like Navy Court. He tried to say his wife was the one who wrote the letter, but no one was buying it because her writing style is way worse. She even tried to take the fall, but no one believed her. They both ended up deleting all social media. Due to this, he got served three Uniform Code of Military Justice articles, which basically are his offenses, but there is more. When you are in the military, you have a deadline on how long you can be a certain rank. If you do not pick up, then you are kicked out. 
and because he was new and got served Uniform Code of Military Justice articles, he will not be up for promotion and therefore was involuntarily separated. Also, the officer program he went through pays for his doctorate in philosophy. When the military pays for your doctorate in philosophy, you have to serve 10 years to pay them back. If you do not complete 10 years, you have to pay the military back with money instead of time. So, he lost his job and now has to pay back the military for his doctorate in philosophy. Since it takes a while for the paperwork to have him and his family sent back stateside, you can bet he socially suffered because no one worked with him. Edit. The hatchet became a symbol of enlisted deviance, because in his letter he stated that two gangs were attacking each other with hatchets and other weapons at an enlisted housing unit. Please allow me to note well in advance, this story is not mine. In fact, it's a rather popular story in a town I once lived in, Savannah, Georgia, and centers around one homeowner who got royally annoyed with a movie producer. There will be a note at the end about the fellow this story is about, for those interested. Okay? So first and foremost, when movie producers are looking for places to set a movie that takes place in colonial or even 1800s cities in the U.S. due to the sheer number of parks, wide roads, and period houses, they will often select Savannah, Georgia. They'll pull all the Spanish moss out of the trees or trim it back, pour dirt on the roads around the squares, and effectively backdate that part of the city to fit most any place, even up to some having used the area as a setting for places like early Washington, D.C., and even places in Britain or France. Typically, when producers do this, they will pay each homeowner whose house is used as background flavor, a couple thousand dollars for the licensing to do so. That will be important later. Trust me, they issue some rules, like no electric lights being visible, not coming out of any door that faces the street, and you have to move your automobiles away from the drive, if you have a drive. Well, 1979, a producer came from Hollywood with the intention of using Savannah for that very purpose. Specifically, the producer was from one of the big three-letter TV channels and was working on making a made-for-TV movie talking about the events after the assassination of Lincoln and the subsequent accusations of the doctor present at his death. The production went to the city to seek permission and then sent an announcement out to each of the homeowners telling them of the various days that the shoot was going to take place. However, much to their downfall, they also noted that the production company would not be compensating the homeowners for the use of their homes as backdrops. This was met with some great annoyance by the homeowners, who turned to the city for help, only to be told that it was their civic duty to allow the use of their homes. Most everyone agreed to this and bit their lips. One homeowner, however, didn't. He decided to get revenge on the production, attempting to screw up their shooting every chance he got. He first started by leaving his car out in front of his house, only to have it towed before filming started. He threatened legal action against the studio, but that fell on deaf ears. He forbade the use of his home in some of the shots, but the production company got the city to make him back down. Eventually, enough was enough. So he waited, biding his time until he was certain they were filming. When the day came that his house was being used as a background shot, the homeowner grabbed a massive Nazi flag and hung it out front of the house out of one of the top windows. The production company balked. They knew that this ruined any shot they'd used there, and what's more they started to question just when he'd put the flag up. Was it just the one day, or had all the previous shots, some which showed the house from across the square, been ruined as well? They turned to the city for help, and the city just basically shrugged saying that it was his First Amendment right to do that, and implied that had the production company paid the homeowners, as had always been done before, then this probably wouldn't have happened. In the end, the production company had to end shooting and go to the homeowner begging for him to remove the offending flag. He did eventually do so, but only after his lawyer got a contract in writing that required the production company to pay all the homeowners for having their homes in the shot. The flag came down and shooting wrapped in less than a day. Interestingly, 
It's said that in the movie in question, The Ordeal of Dr. Mudd, there are several shots where you can see a bright red Nazi flag flying from one of the homes in the distance. That stunt cost a producer quite a substantial amount of money and pushed production back at least a year while they tried to find every single instance that the flag flew in the background shots. This homeowner would go on to himself become very famous, though not for a good reason. Even so, he lives on among the legends of that city, both for his revenge against a movie producer and his later brush with fame. You ever have one of those days where you just want to get from point A to point B with as little hassle as possible? That was me last Tuesday. I was at the airport, standing in line at TSA, just trying to get my bags on the conveyor belt and get through security without any issues. I was groggy, still not fully awake despite my triple-shot espresso. Just another early morning flight, I thought. Little did I know this particular trip was about to take a very unexpected turn. I was in the middle of slipping off my shoes, balancing awkwardly, while trying to keep an eye on my bag and jacket, when I felt this hard shove from the side. I stumbled, barely managing to catch myself on the edge of the conveyor belt. Annoyed, I turned to see who the hell would shove someone at TSA. My eyes met with a woman's cold, piercing glare. She was maybe in her mid-forties, with short platinum blonde hair and an attitude that screamed entitlement. I'm running late, she snapped at me. Like it was my fault she couldn't manage her time, I tried to shake it off. It was too early and I really wasn't in the mood for a confrontation. I just wanted to get through security and find a quiet corner near my gate to zone out until boarding. But this woman, who I later dubbed Karen in my mind for reasons that would become abundantly clear, wasn't done yet. She started shoving my baskets and stuff down the belt, completely disregarding the fact that I wasn't even done taking my laptop out of my bag. Deep breaths, I told myself, it's not worth it. I finished putting my things on the belt as quickly as I could, just wanting to get away from her. I shuffled over to the metal detector line, hoping that would be the end of it. But of course, it wasn't. As I stood there waiting, I suddenly felt a hand on my back pushing me aside. I spun around to see, unsurprisingly, Karen again. She actually cut in front of me, acting as if I was some sort of obstacle in her path. Now I was really angry. Who does that? I got through the metal detector and saw her gathering her things. My blood was boiling at this point. I wasn't going to just let this slide. I marched right up to her, feeling a mix of adrenaline and irritation. Excuse me, I said, my voice a bit louder than I intended, but you can't just put your hands on people like that just because you're running late. She looked at me with a stunned face, like she had no idea what I was talking about. For a moment, I wondered if she even remembered shoving me. What are you talking about? She snapped, her tone dripping with condescension. You shoved me twice, I replied, trying to keep my cool. You pushed me at the conveyor belt, and then you cut in front of me at the metal detector. That's not okay. Her expression shifted from surprise to anger in an instant. I'm in a hurry, she said, as if that justified everything. I have an important meeting I can't miss. I could feel my patience wearing thin. Everyone here has somewhere to be, I retorted. That doesn't give you the right to shove people around. She scoffed, turning back to her belongings. Whatever, just mind your own business. At this point, I was fuming, but I decided to let it go, figuring it wasn't worth the escalation. I collected my things and walked away, heading towards my gate. But as luck would have it, our paths crossed again. I was sitting near my gate, headphones in trying to drown out the world with some music when I saw her approaching. She was talking loudly on her phone, pacing back and forth. I tried to ignore her, but then she started to get more agitated. No, you listen to me. She nearly shouted into her phone. I need that presentation ready by the time I land. This is unacceptable. People were starting to stare, and it was clear she was becoming more unhinged by the minute. Finally, she hung up, and in a fit of rage, threw her phone into her bag with such force that it nearly hit the person sitting next to her. That's when she noticed me watching her. What are you looking at? She snapped, marching over. Before I could react, she lunged at me, shoving me again, this time harder. I stumbled but managed to keep my balance. Enough was enough. 
I wasn't going to let this woman bully me or anyone else. I straightened up and faced her. Back off, I said firmly. You need to calm down, or what? She challenged, her eyes wild with anger. Or I'm going to report you, I replied, my voice steady. You can't keep putting your hands on people, it's assault. She froze for a moment, clearly not expecting me to stand up to her. Then, without another word, she turned on her heel and stormed off. I watched her go, a mix of relief and residual anger churning inside me. A few minutes later, a TSA officer approached me. Apparently, someone had reported the earlier incident, and they wanted to make sure I was okay. I explained what had happened, and they assured me they would keep an eye on her. As I boarded my flight, I couldn't help but feel a strange sense of satisfaction. Sure it had been a stressful encounter, but I was proud of myself for standing up to her. Sometimes, you just have to push back against the Karens of the world. Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment. To preface, I live in a country that employs a large foreign workforce in nearly every industry and at all levels. For someone to move here for work, they must be sponsored by a company or the individual employing them. I own and operate a small restaurant business here and employ many foreigners as servers, cleaners, kitchen staff, drivers, etc. Here's the story. I was lounging on my couch enjoying the last of my weekend when I received a call informing me that one of our sponsored employees, a server named Janice, had been picked up for indecent exposure. Long story short, she was caught engaging in intimate activities with a man in a private booth at a local restaurant. The police walked in on them while they were engaged in heavy petting. They were fully clothed, but the man she was with had exposed himself. It turned out he worked at the restaurant two doors down from where Janice worked. After some chastising and threatening to escalate the situation, the police let them go, but not before they signed a document promising never to repeat the offense. It was basically a slap on the wrist, and everyone got to go home. However, the story doesn't end there. That night, a thought occurred to me. How and why did the police find them in a private booth in the back of a restaurant before the restaurant's own staff did? I called the restaurant the next day. I thought maybe the restaurant staff had called the police immediately, for some reason, or that the couple had become belligerent when staff asked them to stop. It turned out the staff didn't notice anything. In fact, up until that day, the police had never been to that restaurant before. When they did, they simply walked in, went straight to the back booths where the two were seated, and intervened. I realized this meant someone must have seen them and called the police on them. The question was, who, I decided to speak to Janice. I wanted to check in with her and get her version of the situation. I also gave her the you know you did something stupid talk and reassured her that she was keeping her job. I asked her who she thought had called the police. Without hesitation, she said it had to be Sammy, one of our drivers. Why do you think it was Sammy? I asked. He's the one who dropped me off at the restaurant that day. He might have seen my friend walk in right after me and called the police on us, she said. I knew the part about him dropping her off was true since that was his job and her only mode of transport. Well, that sounds a bit drastic. Why would he do that even if he had seen you doing something, I asked. She claimed it was because he was jealous. He was really into her and kept trying to get her to be with him. She then revealed that he had once tried to force himself on her, but she fought him off, and since then he had been very curt with her. My immediate response was, why on earth would you not tell me or one of your managers right away? She said she had dealt with it her way, and it stopped. She didn't want anybody to get fired on her account, and didn't want any interaction with the authorities, so she decided not to make a big deal out of it. She also declined to press formal charges against him, which I advised her to do. Her declining infuriated me even more. This guy was going to get off scot-free, clearly. I was about to fire Sammy, but in my mind, that wasn't enough. For someone to attempt to assault a person and not get in trouble for it was not okay with me. But it seemed like it was something I had to live with. Obviously, my next conversation of the day was with Sammy, my intent was to confront him with the accusations. I called him into my office. I didn't know where to start, so I went with. 
Obviously, you've heard about what happened to Janus this weekend. He stepped in it right away. Heard about it? Came the unexpectedly proud response from a positively beaming Sammy. I called it in. And this is where it started to get super satisfying. For a couple of years since I met Sammy, he would occasionally show us pictures of his wife, who was back home living with his mother. She was younger than him, and quite beautiful, but sadly, unable to have children, which is apparently why she settled with an older man like him. He was so proud of how pretty she was. He was also a devout religious man, or so he claimed. So I asked, and why call the police, he responded. After I dropped her off, I waited to see who she was meeting because she's a troublemaker. When I saw the man walk in after her, I called the police because I know him and he is married, and this is against the laws of God and man. I was smiling now. I knew I had him. Why do that instead of calling your direct manager or even me, before even seeing for yourself what they were doing exactly? Why make it my problem and the company's problem what she does in her own time? Silence. Head down, counting his shoes. Sammy, I know why. I know what you did. Janice just told me. I'm disgusted by you and sorry that we hired you. He had the audacity to mumble. I only tried once, sir. I almost lost my temper anyway. I fired him, handed him a one-way ticket home, which was in four hours, and told him to leave immediately. This is where I get my not-so-petty revenge. I had his house phone number saved from when we hired him. It was on his resume. I knew that because I called him there to interview him before we first hired him. I waited until his flight took off and dialed the number. I assumed either his mother or wife would answer the call, but I was hoping for the latter. I got my wish. Hello, Mrs. Sammy. I'm your husband's employer. Well, his former employer anyway. Just so you know, I fired him a few hours ago, and he's on a flight home as we speak. His flight number is X, he will be arriving at X time. Just so you are aware, I was forced to fire him because he attempted to assault a fellow employee half his age. I'm sorry, I said, and promptly hung up, but not before hearing her gasping in shock. This happened a few days ago so it's fresh in my memory. I'm fortunate not to have many of these stories, but this encounter stood out to me because of how sudden and jarring it was. Context. I am a 24-year-old bi-gender person, accepting any pronouns, though I present as female due to my larger chest, which I have no desire to change. I work at a TJ Maxx and Home Goods combination store. My main job involves either unpacking boxes in the back or retrieving the trolleys from the corrals. Occasionally, if there are no boxes to be processed and it's too hot to get trolleys, I get very easily overheated and my managers are fine with me helping out in other areas when it's hot. I take the bins of pet stuff from the back room and go through each bin, putting toys and treats on the hooks and laying out pet beds. Because I don't want to block traffic too much, and because there are three or four aisles in the department, requiring me to move back and forth a lot, I don't like to roll the bins into the aisles themselves. Instead, I keep them under one of the tables we have on display, or out of the way if the table gets sold. Generally, when I'm working in the pet department, I'm doing a lot of back and forth through the aisles. I acknowledge that traffic can be high sometimes, so I always preface my movements with a polite sorry, excuse me, pardon me, etc. If I ever find that I have to accommodate shoppers, 99% of the time, they're more than happy to step to the side, often apologizing in turn, to which I always reply that it's no problem, and I'll only be a second. I've never had any issues with this before, as I'm typically very non-confrontational and easy to get along with, unless you attack me personally. Q hour scene a few days ago. The cast, me equals me, the part-time employee just trying to do my job, L equals entitled lady MH equals my hero. The person who stood up for me, I was putting away some pet beds and came around the corner to head back to the bin to grab more items to put out. I saw L with her cart in the center of the aisle, perpendicular to another aisle, blocking the entire T-section which happened to be the center point of my traffic. She was on her phone, and I assumed she was just stopped for a moment to send a quick text. I politely waited behind her for a minute or two, 
giving her time to finish her text and move on. After waiting for what seemed like a reasonable amount of time, I gently cleared my throat to get her attention, as I didn't want to shove by her or tap her on the shoulder. Our initial exchange went something like this, me, excuse me ma'am, may I please squeak by for just a second? Elle glared at me and moved her cart approximately two inches. I waited for a moment, confused, but realized she expected my round body to fit through that small gap. Figuring that's all she would give me, I pressed myself against the shelves to create as much distance between us as possible out of respect, and managed to squeeze by, apologizing profusely as I did so. I picked up a few random items from the bin and turned back towards the aisles. Elle had returned her cart to the exact same position, still on her phone and not looking like she would move anytime soon. I didn't think much of it and resolved to work around her as best I could, assuming it must be an important text exchange. Other customers started glaring at El because they were trying to get from one point to another using the most convenient route, which Elle had now been blocking for about 10 minutes. They were forced to maneuver their carts the long way. Some gave pointed stares at me, as if to say that as the employee I should say something. So I tried to approach the conversation gently and tactfully, standing a little off to the side of Elle's cart and thinking through what I would say to keep things civil and avoid a huge argument. I finally gathered my courage and gently cleared my throat again. Me, excuse me, no sooner had the words left my mouth. I hadn't even begun to ask her to kindly move off to the side where there was plenty of room. She suddenly snapped at me, L, I'm shopping, you're working, you're going to have to wait. I stood there, stunned, unsure of what had just happened. Her sudden hostility when I had been nothing but polite and had barely begun to speak shocked me into silence. Her logic that her texting was more important than my job left me confused. I stammered an apology and hurriedly left the scene feeling a familiar feeling well inside my chest. For background, I have moderate post-traumatic stress disorder from past experiences. Being startled or screamed at is one of my triggers, so when people suddenly snap at me, it sends my body into flight mode and skyrockets my anxiety, causing me to cry as a fear response. Oddly, if I know I'm in the wrong, this response doesn't happen, as my brain rationalizes why I'm being yelled at but when I'm scolded for no reason, it sends me back to darker days. Not wanting to burst into tears in the middle of the store, I retreated to the break room to give myself five minutes to calm down. When I returned to the sales floor, the first thing I noticed was the sound of more yelling but not at me. I returned to my place in the pet department, and as I approached, I saw L having a heated argument with an older gentleman, M.H. I couldn't catch all of their conversation, but it went something like this. L. Spoiled youths who think they own the place, M. H. I watched the whole thing, madam, and that young lady was nothing but polite and respectful. It's you who thinks you own the place by parking your cart in the middle of the aisle. You're creating an obstacle, not only for the poor employee who's just doing her job, but for other customers as well. If you could just scoot over a smidgen, L. I'm busy, I don't have time for nonsense, these people need to respect my space and move around me. There are other ways they can go. Curious and flattered that someone thought to speak up for me, I hid behind a shelf to watch this unfold. M.H. continued. M.H., you had no right to snap at her like that. I bet the poor thing is wondering what she did to deserve it. Honestly, if that were me, I would have given you an earful, but since that kind young lady was too polite to do so herself, I'll give you one now. Move your darn cart out of the way. Bill was getting red in the face, and people were staring. I tried to make myself small so people wouldn't notice I was watching. But when one of my co-workers saw me, they walked over and asked if that was the lady who upset me. I told them it was, and they approached the arguing pair, instructing L to leave the store or they would call the police to have her removed. A mostly empty threat, but it was enough to make her leave in a huff. I finally came out of hiding, and M.H. saw me and asked if I was okay. I told him I was and thanked him for standing up for me. He told me that after seeing a lot of young people being disrespectful, it was refreshing to see someone with good manners, and that he wasn't going to stand for the mistreatment of a rare soul like mine. He then politely excused himself and returned to his shopping. 
I went back to sorting the pet stuff with a spring in my step. I haven't seen L again since then, but MH pops by once in a while and sometimes brings his dog, which he happily lets me pet. The previous home I owned had previously been rented, and that tenant had thrown up a quick little chain link fence for his dog. Had the corners right at the corner of the house, just a quick fix that got the job done. I don't have a dog, so fence, no fence didn't matter to me. The day I moved in, my very young neighbor came over and asked, since she ran a daycare from her house, that was a whole other nightmare. She'd really like to put up a fence, and to save money could they just tie into mine and save the cost of fencing an entire side of the fence. Now, I may be younger, but I'm not dumb. I knew that if they did that they would be fencing in part of my property, and after a certain number of years with their maintenance of it they would then own that property between our houses. Now we're not talking a lot here. The houses were maybe 15 feet across, but if they did that they would own everything up to the edge of my house. Even my air conditioner unit would be on their property. So I told her this and said no, she cannot now or ever tie into the fence. Mentioned that interaction with my realtor, and she about threw a fit. Seems this person tried asking her the same thing and she told her the same thing. Now if this was just a one-time trying her luck thing it wouldn't be a big deal, but she kept asking off and on for a few years, and I kept saying no, even the husband came over to ask. Maybe to intimidate a single woman, still said no, I even did the research, and got the actual property line map that showed exactly where our property lines were. One day I saw a whole bunch of chain link fencing in their backyard, dot but not nearly enough to fence all the sides they needed to do. They were going to try and tie in anyway, despite me repeatedly telling them no. So that night I took down, rolled up the fence and dug up every single fence post, now the neighbor had to come out and watch the kids she was supposed to be watching, because my fence wasn't there anymore, so the kids had more avenues to escape. Plus it took them a bit longer to order more of the chain link fence and posts they suddenly needed. When I sold the house I gave the new owner, a single man, a care package which included the official property line map, and a note to watch those neighbors like a hawk. My realtor, yep, same one, I loved her so much I used her again, knew the entire story and gave him the rundown as well. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences and opinions in the comments below and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.